Thank you to our choir. In the name of our good and perfect Heavenly Father, whose inspired word is our answer key. In the name of Jesus, our rabbi teacher, who lived out every lesson and objective in thought, word, and deed. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, our guide and tutor, who prepares and equips us to face every test. Amen. As we approach midterms for the traditional spring semester, have any of you yet had that dream? This is a dream where you find yourself in a classroom, it appears, on what seems to be a major exam day. Specific details seem more elusive, like what class is this? Or how can it be a major exam day when I did not fully realize I was even enrolled in this course? Yet, the dream continues, and you find yourself sitting for an exam for which you feel woefully unprepared and ill-equipped and certain you will fail. Is that just me? In real life, of course, you are robustly and fully prepared for any exam or even a pop quiz that any faculty member might administer. And if for whatever reason you need additional tools and preparation, you know full well that the Academic Resource Center is at the ready. In that spirit, this week I called the internet for proven test-taking strategies through which we might consider and reflect upon today's text from James chapter 1. After all, it details a very real test of sorts. The first test-taking strategy I encountered was to focus on one problem at a time. So for starters, if we explore the problem in front of us, we discover it is in ourselves. Each of us is tempted when we are dragged away by our own evil desires and enticed. James in this chapter is showing us that sin is a process. It begins from the desires of our hearts being entertained in our minds and eventually carried out in our actions. If we consider as a lesson the story of David and Bathsheba, we can certainly identify so many ways in which that sin could have been avoided from the point of initial temptation, which in and of itself is not a sin. David could have gone back into his palace, but he kept looking. Then he sent for Bathsheba. Then he committed adultery. There were so many decisions and actions that came after the temptation on which he chose to act. So in focusing upon one problem at a time, we can begin with our sinful selves and where that sin can ultimately lead us if left unchecked. Kirchville cautions, if we continue to give in to our desires, which leads us to act in sin, the continuation of sin gives birth to death. James is telling us that the reason we get shaken in or lose our faith is not because of God, but because we are giving in to our desires, which leads to a practice of sin, which ultimately can lead to our complete separation from God. God is not destroying you. You are destroying you. Separation from God all begins with us excusing our sinning and caving into our desires. Your desire needs to be changed or fulfilled in godly ways. Romans 13 reminds us, let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity or promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Next in our listing of test-taking tips is to study and memorize the formula. That needs to be extremely clear and easy and the top of one's mind during a test. While I have alluded to it already, let's review the full formula now. Desire plus opportunity plus action plus no forgiveness equals punishment. Left unchecked, with no new variables inserted, sin and Satan will overcome us if we receive this eternal punishment. Yet temptation and sin can be overcome by stopping its development at any of the four stages along the way. 
and thanks and praise be to God that he is most willing and able to help us overcome sin at any place in the formula. Copeland summarizes, God helps us to control our desires to succumb to temptation by providing his word to renew our minds. God helps us to limit opportunities through his providence if we pray for such. God helps us exercise self-control over our actions through his spirit strengthening our innermost being. And God helps us to obtain forgiveness through the blood of his son as we repent and pray. Not only is the formula clear and the solution set provided, but through the grace and goodness of Jesus, our teacher, we can seek his direct help at any time. As I explored test-taking tips and strategies on the internet, I came across the selection of listening to music on multiple lists. There is a song, God is Good All the Time, which I will not sing a cappella for you now, lest the dream reference with which I started my message quickly turn into a nightmare. But if that song or one like it about God's endless goodness is now an earworm in your mind, we are in a good place to unpack this tip. Verse 13 of James 1 text reads, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Here we can and should distinguish to test from to tempt. In Genesis 22, the Old Testament lesson for this week, we learn how God tested Abraham. In 2 Chronicles, we read how God tested Hezekiah by leaving him alone for a while to see what he would do. We see that same distinction throughout the book of Job. And while we have already established that Satan tempts us in order to lead us to eternal punishment and separation from God, God's testing is of a diametrically different design. Carson characterizes this distinction. He writes, we have to come to the terms with the fact that God is more interested in our holiness than our happiness. He is more interested in our faithfulness than in our financial resources. He is more interested in our purity than in our power our self-control than our sexual prowess, our eternal life than our eternal wealth, our endurance than our reputation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our sin is corrosive in our lives. It corrupts us, it enslaves us, and without a way to redemption and restoration, our Yahweh who sent the way, it most certainly leads us to death and damnation. Today's James text is not the only place in our test's answer book where this lesson is covered, of course. In the very first verse of the very first psalm, we read, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. At first glance, our 21st century English speaking ears might think, isn't it a good thing to stand in the way of sinners, to block them from sinning? Yet in the original Hebrew, to stand in someone's way means to stand in their sandals, to do what they do, to absorb and reflect their habits and lifestyles. If you hang exclusively with the ungodly, it is pretty likely that you will stand in their way and continue to walk with them. Carson concludes, it may be pornography, it may be cherished bitterness, it may be a style of speech that is endlessly unkind, it may be a form of harshness to one's spouse that is distant and never sacrificial, it may be the kind of sustained prayerlessness that confesses the creed but acts if God just isn't there. Eventually, those sins become so ingrained and embedded in us, they stamp out our whole character. Or it may be that these things erupt when we have a crisis. Because you have some Christian commitment, you want to know, what is God doing with me? I'm not doing anything wrong. Why is he picking on me? What starts off as a tragedy 
becomes a deep-seated enmity, a hatred of God. Yet the reality is, what is being leveled against us by the devil, the world, and our flesh can be used by our gracious and loving God for good and for our eternal good. If there's someone in Scripture to whom we might relate as having faced valleys and hardships, it could be Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers, believed dead, wrongly imprisoned for years, he faced some deeply challenging times. Much farther in his life story, after God had promoted him to unbelievable earthly positions and opportunities, after he had reconciled with his brothers, his father Jacob has died, and his brothers now fear that with the old man dead and buried, Joseph may choose to exact a nasty revenge. So when they come before Joseph, essentially to spit out the age-old sibling mantra, Dad said you have to forgive us and be nice to us in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph spits out the best short answer response that test question could have warranted. When in verse 20 we read, you meant to harm me, but God intended it for a good purpose. Joseph recognized that the one unchangeable and reliable aspect of his life was his ever-loving and ever-faithful God. For that reason, he could trust and rely upon God even in the midst of unfathomable challenges of this life. I recognize that midterm exams are coming, but I'm here to tell you that much larger tests are looming. Some of you have already sat for some of those exams, perhaps in a holding cell, at the unexpected death in your family, or the raw ache of a bedrock relationship that did not end in physical death, but in their conscious choice to walk away from you. And as sure as I'm standing before you, you will face other temptations and trials. So I offer additional tips for these kinds of tests. Remove distractions, study God's word with others, teach this vital content to someone else so that the Holy Spirit can introduce or reinforce it to you both, and take advantage of God's office hours and talk with him directly whenever you need. In closing, James employs a distinctive and delightful descriptor of our Father God in verse 17 of today's text, where we read, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. God's goodness is constant. There is no variation in him. Instead of shadows, God, the Father of lights. According to Hebert, the phrasing in James, the Father of the lights, is to connect and reference the specific celestial bodies that light up the sky, both day and night. Due to God's created design, the sun and stars never stop giving light, even when we can't see them. When night comes, darkness isn't the fault of the sun, it is shining as brightly as ever. Rather, the earth has turned from the sun, which causes the darkness to come. So in our lives, we turn away and rotate from God. Yet today and every day, let us thank and praise God for sending us Jesus, the propitiation of our sin, who turned away God's wrath so that we, kind of like our exam paper, could submit and turn the Hebrew meaning of repent toward him for restored life, life abundant, life eternal. God's continued blessings and every one of you on your upcoming tests, amen.
please stand for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of another day to serve and worship you. Please bless us and be with us in the many tasks of the day and give us strength and energy and health for all things we are called to do. Today we include special petitions for Cynthia Rutan, a supporter of Concordia, who is diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing treatment. Also for a neighbor of student Alex Ford, who suffered a serious injury and was hospitalized. Heavenly Father, for these your servants and all who look upon you for healing, we pray for wisdom and skill for the doctors and all who attend to them, for healing according to your gracious will, and for strength and for comfort in your love and presence in their times of need. Today we also pray for a young woman who will soon give birth. Gracious Father, we pray for your protection for this mother and child. Give strong faith to them and bring them comfort in this anxious time. Watch over them physically and also surround them with others to support and care for their needs. We pray for all involved with Concordia's musical this weekend. Heavenly Father, grant them stamina and health and the ability to perform well, that the spirits of many are lifted and it can be a celebration of gifts and talents you give to many here. We also pray for our school this day. Lord, make us to be fitting to our name, Concordia, where our hearts are together in support of and care of each other. Send your spirit among us that your faith is strengthened and we are drawn closer to you in this challenging time. Help us to be faithful in our daily tasks that all we do may glorify you. Bless our administrators and leaders with wisdom and peace as they serve. Hear these and all the prayers on our hearts and in our minds as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Go in peace.